This week's episode of the And She Looked Up podcast is brought to you by Fine Lime Illustrations. If you love quirky, colorful art transformed into fun, handmade stationery items, pretty much guaranteed to brighten somebody's day, that's just what you'll find in my new online shop at finelimeillustrations.com. That's fine, as in I'm fine, lime as in the fruit, illustrations.com. Browse the entire collection or sign up for my email list to see some behind the scenes peeks into my studio. You'll also get first notice of new product launches and subscriber only sales. And as an added little bonus, you'll also receive a free coloring sheet to help you relax and de-stress from your day. And now on with the show. Welcome to the And She Looked Up podcast. Each week, we sit down with inspiring Canadian women who create for a living. We talk about their creative journeys and their best business tips, as well as the creative and business mindset issues all creative entrepreneurs struggle with. I'm your host, Melissa Hartfield, and after leaving a 20-year career in corporate retail, I've been happily self-employed for 12 years. I'm a graphic designer, an illustrator, and a multi-six-figure-a-year entrepreneur in the digital content space. This podcast is for the artists, the makers, and the creatives who want to find a way to make a living doing what they love. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the And She Looked Up podcast. As always, I am your host, Melissa, and today, Heather Travis is back with me. It's been a little while, Heather. Welcome. I know. How are you, Melissa? (laughs) I am okay. I don't even know what day it is. (laughs) It's sometime in the winter. (laughs) And that's what it feels like. It's that point in the winter where it's like, is it ever going to end? No. Mm Today, we are going to do a different kind of episode. We are going to be looking at our collective wisdom as uh, women of a certain age, I guess. (laughs) 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 And today's episode is going to be about the things that we know now that we wish we could go back and tell our younger selves, um, either as a form of advice or a form of reassurance or I don't know, just a little confidence boost. And this is something, I don't know about you, Heather, this is something I've been thinking about quite a bit. I think I've mentioned on the show before that I turned 50 in August. And I think it's always interesting with these milestone birthdays because it's not so much that I'm thinking about like, oh, is this what 50 feels like? Like, I don't know. I guess this is what 50 feels like because this is how I feel, but (laughs) it's more just, I think those kind of birthdays always give you pause to look back on where you've come, but also look forward to where you're going. And I think 50 is an interesting one because that's like, you, you know, in your head, you're probably past the halfway point, right? So you really start to (laughs) you really start to think about what you want the second half to be like yes Um, Yes. I've been and I've been thinking about that too funny enough because I'm turning 45 in March and the sort of halfway markers like 40 45 50 all like to me that's I mean I love I'm a birthday girl I love Mm. so that's but so every year is like it's my and in fact, every, the 28th of every month is my birth anniversary. So just a fun fact for everybody. Um, so uh, I have been thinking about it. And I, particularly funny enough, I spent, uh, and you know this, I just spent a couple of weeks visiting with my parents in Florida. And it was so nice to stay in a warm place. But also, it was so fascinating. My mom and I were talking about my grandfather, because it would have been his 106th birthday uh which you know he did not live to 106 in fact he died at 52 and so he had been dead longer than he had been alive and my mom just turned 70 I'm 45 almost and so I was just sort of thinking about their life like holy crap what they lived through and you and I have talked about our shared eastern European ancestry and the life that our parents and grandparents lived as a result of that and And then what 
like I constantly am like, wow, my mom at 45 was so different than me at 45. And not just because we're different people, but like the world has changed. There's so much that's different. And that's why I, cause I'm with you on the, like, do, is this what 45 feels like? Is this what 50 feels like? And I think it's because of our perceptions, like Christ on a cracker, the golden girls, right? Like we're told that they, they're the same age as I think the Friends cast would be now, I believe. In terms of like, they were only playing mid 50 year olds or something. Like it wasn't. But they felt, it felt like they were grandmas, you know, like, yeah. like they were old ladies. Old and ladies. Obviously and we were a lot younger. Like old, old lady. Like, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting now, like just what, what 50 is today it's so different but one of the things I have definitely noticed and this is something I've been warned about for years is that when you sort of hit that 50 you become invisible and I've definitely felt that in the last year and a half I would say like I've just disappeared from the face of the earth Um, and I think it's really interesting because 50 is I would say probably having been through my 40s I feel like 40s is the decade where you get really comfortable with yourself. Like that's when you're just like, you figured out who you are and you're getting comfortable with it. And um, if you've had kids, your life is starting to free up a little bit and you can really be you as opposed to being mom or wife or. Yeah. Yeah. So I think when you, hit 50 that's when you start to realize like wow I know a lot of stuff like I've I've done a lot of stuff and I know a lot of stuff but nobody really gives a crap (laughs) yeah and and what's also incredible and this is like oh the stupidity of youth when we thought we knew everything now at 44 and three quarters I I know so much more and, uh, and what's even more incredible is I now know that there's so much more I don't know. So much more I got to figure out. Like, like I, I got to learn. But I've, I've, and I've only got, you know, I'm, yes. I'm halfway through. Yes. And I thought, honestly, and I was thinking about it this morning in anticipation of this episode, was I thought, like, I remember sitting and looking at my parents and thinking, God, it must be so nice to be grown up. You don't have to come up with homework. You don't have to go to school all day and have people tell you what to do. Man, I would trade. I would go back and be a student all over again. The adulting. <laughs> and, but at, also at the same time, there's so much homework that I think just life gives you. Right. And that's the like we're always doing as adults. You're always doing homework and you're always going to school. And if you're not, you're missing out. That's mm-hmm. the, in my mind, like yeah. the, if you, if the evolution stops and you don't, I don't know, it's like the peak you people and you're like, you, you peaked in high school and you've stayed there. Oh. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that you went to high school with where that's true, yeah. but yeah. there's, there's an awful lot of people you went to high school with who, who suddenly became so interesting when you meet them again later in life (laughs) yes oh my gosh and that's I mean I have reconnected with girls that I went to high school with and it's not to say that we weren't friends we were friendly we went to the same high school we were in the same graduating class uh you know we socialized ish but I didn't call them to check where they were going to be on Friday night we just so happened that we would end up at the same place right? right so it was sort of that type of uh, you know, they went to university. We went to university. I never kept in touch with them. We, you know, particularly through the internet, you come back together. And some of those, what I'll call peripheral friendships, have been some of the most surprising and like, wow, we have so much in common. Or you so surprise me, you. Uh, and I love that. I love that. I yeah. love seeing people who then surprise me with their awesomeness, with what cool things they've done, with what they do in life. And I don't mean that I had low expectations from them. Not that at all. Just, I, I find it so cool what people do with themselves. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I, I think, think about it. 
when you're a teenager, you're so busy trying to fit in that you kind of um, soften all those things that make you cool and interesting because you yeah. you don't want to be the different kid. And usually what makes you interesting is what makes you different, right? So you're just so busy trying to cloak that <laughs> when you're, you know, yeah. in your teens. And so very often you don't even know, your friends don't even know it's there until you get past that really awkward stage. So yeah, I, I think learning is what keeps us young, to be honest. I think the minute you stop learning and, and, and I'm not talking about book learning or stuff like that, but just being interested and curious in the world. Totally. Curious is such a great word. I love it. Um, that's when you, when you, when that stops, then, you know, your time is probably done. Like why yeah. <laughs> to be, to be really blunt. That's why I'd love meeting new people, but also reconnecting with old, because I love, I'm always like, tell me more. Oh, tell me more. Tell mm -hmm. me more. Tell me about how did you get from here to there? How, tell, tell me more. And I think that also comes with the wisdom of age. Like I love talk as we podcast together, Melissa, I love talking. <laughs> I could talk for days. I have lots of interesting things to say, but I have learned that there's a gr so much to be learned from, from just shutting up <laughs> and asking <laughs> questions and being super curious about other people and the world around you, because mm -hmm. that that's when, when I do open my mouth and say things, I want them to be more informed, more enlightened and, and have other people say, wow, sh she knew a lot. She enlightened me. I'm curious now to learn more like that, that, it's like sharing of stories and being a better storyteller and absorbing more about the world around me. And like, there's so many cool podcasts to listen to now, like where all of this stuff, man, you had to listen to like bootleg radio station tapes to hear some of the stuff that we can just like, boop, internet, I can hear this now. Yeah. Crazy. It's amazing what we have access to today. Um, yeah. So that's basically what today's episode is going to be about. We're going to be sharing some of the things that we have learned over the years that we wish we could tell our younger self. But we also um, asked uh, our friends and I put a call out to the and she looked up audience. And interestingly enough, I didn't have any listeners respond, but a lot of past guests responded. So oh. that'll be interesting to see what some of the ladies who have been or can we, do we use the term ladies anymore? I don't even know. Some of the women who have been on the show previously, yeah. some of the things that they wish they could tell their younger selves. So Ooh, cool. um, I think that'll be fun. So let's kick it off with you, Heather. What is the one thing you wish you could go back and tell younger Heather, not necessarily business related, but just in general to ease her mind or make her feel better or yeah. What, what's the one thing? So it lands in both. When I was thinking of this, I divided it up into business advice. I would give younger business Heather or sort of Heather sort of in her twenties ish was sort of where I was thinking. Uh, and then in life and what ended up in both buckets uh, were the words dream bigger. Mm. And and it's interesting to say that because I've done a lot of cool stuff in my life and I've done, I've had neat jobs and had cool experiences. Uh, but I would say a lot of, it just sort of happened. And I would, I would go back and tell myself that there's so much more that you can dream of and so much, much bigger that you can dream. and. And same thing in business, you can dream bigger, you can be more ambitious, you can do more. And uh, yeah, like dream bigger. And I, and I, part of this, I think stems and we've talked about it a lot, but I, my like dream was to be a stay at home mom. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I, that was my dream. And if I could trust, boop, I would. But I want to, it, 
to me, the dream bigger is, is more about not changing those dreams, but almost embracing the um, improv mantra of yes. And mm-hmm. so mm, that's a good you can be stay at home mom, Heather, and, and have your five children and live in the house and the ball flip station wagon and all the things that I envisioned. Yes. And you can also do this, do that. You could have an art studio and sell paintings on the side. You could be the best damn, you know, assistant craft teacher on Wednesdays at your kid's school. It Yes. And yes. And yes. And, and I think that that, uh, I limited myself to thinking of doing one thing. And Mm -hmm. I think that's where the dream bigger comes in. And the yes. And comes in is that the world is a huge, massive place. We all have huge amounts of skills and things that will pique our curiosity. And I think the days, unless you're like, I want to be a doctor and you've always wanted to fix people or, you know, my, my brother, for instance, always wanted to be a musician. He's a musician, but, but what piques his curiosity influences how he makes his albums, just like an artist, if what piques their curiosity. And, and so we can change tax and that's the yes. And like, you and I have both had multiple careers doing vastly different things. They're common thread. And that common thread is what makes you unique and what me make me unique. And I think if I had been encouraged to say yes, and I would have t- taken bigger leaps uh, to embrace more of what makes Heather unique and do maybe bigger things. Yeah. And I'm only just starting to realize now that like, I've always joked world domination is my goal, but now I'm actually just realizing I'm like, fuck, I could accomplish that. I can do that. And, and that, that I feel like, and it's not that nobody told me I couldn't do awesome things. Do you know what I mean? Like I was always very positively encouraged in all of that, but I think it was that me telling me, Heather, Yes, and like be bigger, be bolder, do more, dream bigger for yourself. And because you can do it. And if you can't, you'll figure out how. I think that's the, I think that was the thing that always stopped me. It's interesting because our inner voice is the voice we listen to. It has the biggest influence over who we are, far more than anybody else outside of us. And what you just said there about, how it had to come from you to dream bigger. Like that's such a classic example of your inner voice being the one who's holding you back. Yeah. Not that it's not the people around you that were saying you can't do this. It was you that was saying, yeah, this isn't, this is enough. Yeah. That's, that's enough. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting how, how loud <laughs> our inner voice is and how yes. authoritative and think, it is. And I think too, you know, you open yourself up by simply even having that thought of opening myself up that that all of the people, perhaps the yes and would also have come from people around me because of they would have seen or felt that willingness for the yes and from me. So the person who gave that positive feedback, wow, you're really good at this, Heather. I would have, I hopefully by embracing the yes and in myself, they would have seen it and said, you're really good at this, Heather. You know, we might have a, because they saw that maybe I would bite. Do you know what I mean? And it's not to say that they didn't see that I would bite. I was offered opportunities and some I took and some I didn't, but like, I don't know. I just feel like if you put it out there or you sort of strut through the world with that, that maybe more of it will manifest itself. I know that's (laughs) Like I should just hang some crystals on my head. I don't know. I just that bit, dream, dream bigger and take more, take more risks. I think would be the big one. I would go back and in, in my DeLorean and tell younger Heather. <laughs> I think for me, actually, I don't think I know for me. Yeah. And I wish I could go back and tell probably my 15 or 16 year old self or maybe my 14 year old self and probably again, my 20 year old self and my 30 year old self uh, would be cause, cause it would need reinforcing <laughs> multiple times um, would be to stop worrying, 
stop mm. worrying so much. I, when I look back at how much of my life I have spent worrying about things that never happened, or some of them did happen, but most of them didn't, uh, what a complete and utter waste of time and mental energy and stress I inflicted upon myself. And I don't, I don't know if there's a way I could have avoided all of that. I think you just have to get through the life experience of realizing that, yeah, it, it, crappy things are going to happen. Like this is the thing. Nobody gets through life without crappy things happening. It's it's impossible. It's just, that's how life works. You get good things, you get bad things and you, you, you know, you have to deal with them. Um, but I think the thing that I've come to realize is that, yeah, we get dealt bad things and let's be honest, you know, I am a white woman living on the West coast of Canada in one of the most beautiful places in the world with one of the best standards of living in the world. The bad things that have happened to me are on a, on a global scale, <laughs> you know, I have a house, I have clothing, I have food, yes. like I'm doing okay, but <laughs> it doesn't diminish, it doesn't diminish, it doesn't diminish yes. the, the bad things will still happen. But the thing is humans, have you seen um, some of the interviews going around with Brendan Fraser with his new, um, movie that's come out the whale yes. and yes. um he's getting a lot of oscar buzz for it and the clip that they keep showing is him saying in the movie that human beings are amazing and we are like i hear that line and it gives me chills every time i see it on screen because we're so freaking resilient um we think we think that all these things are going to happen that are going to break us, but they don't. We just keep going. And that's that's pretty remarkable, right? And I think that's kind of what I wish I could go back and just tell myself many times is like, just stop worrying. You're going to get through all the hard things. It's going to be hard. There's going to be days where it's really hard, but you know, you can't stop the bad things from happening. So worry, worrying about them is, is not going to make them stop. They're going to happen one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just so much stress and anxiety that I have inflicted upon myself from worrying about everything. Um, and I think somewhere in my 40s I kind of let go that's not to say I don't worry anymore I do but nowhere near on the scale I think part of it is I'm just so flipping tired some days I don't have the energy to worry <laughs> but yeah. yeah and I think that worry also plays into the the whole dream bigger thing that you said is like I was just always I one of the things I worried a lot about was what people would think um yeah. just so, such a waste of time <laughs> yeah. like of all the things to worry about that is the biggest waste of time um to yes. worry about what other people are going to think and yet when I was younger that was so important to me and uh not and it wasn't I wasn't worrying about like do people think I have enough money or that I'm successful enough that's not the stuff I was worrying about I was worrying about like will they still like me like mm -hmm. so rooted in self-esteem, right? Yeah. Which is, <laughs> and I, honestly, that's, that's like 90% of being a teenager, right? And that's your figure. Self-esteem is figuring yourself out. That's, but I, I, I never really grew out of it. I was still struggling with it within my 20s and my 30s. And, um, and I think, yeah. So anyway, that would be my big piece yeah. of advice would be to just stop worrying. Take some yeah. deep breaths and just keep going. You'll figure it out. Um, yeah. and that's the thing we all figure it out. Like we, we all get presented with situations we've never dealt with before, but we figure it out. Yes. Oh my right? gosh. Yes. And, and I think too, you know, we, I think one of the big things, particularly for me with the worry and stress is actually realizing that I am giving people way more credit, uh, than they deserve the energy that they spend thinking about me mm -hmm. and right and so well, they're worrying about what you're thinking about them. 
right? And, or for instance, like you're thinking to yourself, oh gosh, you know what? I haven't seen X person. It's going to be, there's, there's this, there's going to be that. That person is thinking about cleaning their bathroom before you get there. That's what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about uh, their kid's soccer tournament. They have to get ready for the next morning. They're thinking about like, they're thinking about their things and you're thinking about your things. Your things might be concerning them, but it's in relation to you. But it's easier said than done. It's so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. I've given that advice to a million people for in a million different ways. And then I found myself funny and for a family event this summer, just agonizing over what of this, that, the other. And then I realized that nobody else actually gave a fuck. And I can yeah. either get off get off of yourself. <laughs> uh okay. So let's talk about it from a business standpoint. So if you could go back and tell younger Heather one thing business-wise that you yeah. wish she could know, what would it be? Oh, this is a big one. And I've been thinking about this for a long time, but funny enough, your recent uh, episode with Pamela from Sand Dollar Financial, mm -hmm. her, man, if people have not listened to that episode, go listen to that it was episode. A good episode. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good episode. There were a bunch of zingers that she delivered that hit me like a ton of bricks that truly, like if I could put her in the DeLorean with me and take her back and it's not even to business, Heather, starting my own business, like say a decade ago, this is going back to like, I would say Heather moving out on her own, uh, being an adult, get to know, know the numbers, understand the numbers, understand what it is you're signing when you uh, take a visa out. Um, understand more about your mortgage than what the person across the table that's sliding the papers across the table from you is telling you. Under understand like the numbers, understand the numbers. I really internalized really early on that I was not good at numbers, yet I excelled in things that related to numbers, like physics was one of my favorite classes. That's all, it's just applied mathematics. That's all physics is. Uh, and I excelled at it. I just had to figure out how to fit 35 concentric circles that were five and a quarter inches onto a canvas that is six inches by 48. And I did that using math without a calculator, I will tell you. <laughs> and, and I managed million dollar budgets for clients, but I have always been very scared of uh let's say solidifying the number knowledge because it would solidify what I don't know and not knowing the numbers makes me very scared and part of Pamela's like values and what you internalize that really hit me on the head uh in terms of just some of the the fears that I've always had about money I realize now come from experiences that I had mm. and, and where why I treat money the way I do yeah. And I, and I, <clears throat> I never understood the why of that. It, it sort of just bang. It was like, bing, light bulb. Oh my gosh. But I, I have in probably the last five years, I don't want to say regret because I don't have regrets, but I feel like I could have dreamt bigger <laughs> if the financial literacy and the understanding of how I can make money work for me was more applied early on like in my twenties and thirties. Financial education, financial literacy in this country is pathetic. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. It's, it is possibly the most important thing that you could learn in high school mm -hmm. and it's not taught mm -mm. or not taught anywhere near <clears throat> the way it should be. And I'm not talking about like really in-depth financial knowledge. I'm talking about the basics, like how yeah. interest works and yeah. how, what happens when you take out a loan and things like yeah. that, like just yeah. completely lacking. And I, Pamela and I talked about this. And for those of you wondering, this was episode 126, Money Mindset Matters for Working Creatives. If you want to go back and have a listen to it, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, again, and this is where you have these situations, particularly budgeting, which you need for life and your business. You need to know yeah. how to budget. Yes. Um, where you have people who don't know how to do that. And it makes life really challenging. It makes running a business really challenging. And, you know, we're in, in this situation now where we're seeing these interest rates going up and up, although yeah. they seem to have stabilized a bit. And we've still got people freaking out about a 3.5% interest rate, but 
I'm old enough. This is one of the benefits of being an old lady. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember my parents when they had a mortgage that was at 13%. About to right? say, like, yeah. there were like people had things at 18%. They, it was like our next door neighbors this- lost their house because they wound up having to renew at 17%. Like, yeah. yes. like, and and so in the back of my head, if I were buying a house, that would be in the back of my head. Like, what happens if interest rates yeah. skyrocket by the time I have to renew my mortgage or, or if I do a variable rate or whatever? Yeah. It, it, you know, so. When you haven't had the experience of living through those things, it becomes kind of like a, yeah, like an esoteric kind of thing. Like, yeah, interest rates could go up, but that never happens. Totally. Right? And, and honestly, and truly, like I, I've had this discussion with girlfriends. I mean, Brian and I are very open and, and w- our finances are completely blended finances. It is household finances. Um, and that transparency lends well to the transparency of our marriage and which is all obviously a very healthy thing uh particularly when so many people know that financial issues are are the root of so many people's marriage issues and it's one of the reasons i'm still single (laughs) and why i never got married i conversations with people who are like oh my gosh like i have a credit card my husband doesn't even know about and i'm like what the fuck like that is, I'm, I, I, I think if the financial literacy had been there, those choices would not, people wouldn't, we wouldn't make them as flippantly. We wouldn't, I don't know. There's so much. And I, I have so much more to learn. And honestly, I bet you, I could bet you a million dollars, which I don't have. <laughs> that that if Brian was hearing this right now, he would be rolling his eyes because he and I have conversations, lengthy conversations about my, not conversations, like he educates me on things. He'll be like, okay, here's what we're doing. And not, here's not what I'm doing, but here's what we're doing. I'm wanting your buy-in. And if you don't understand what we are doing as a family, as a unit with our money, I need to educate you on that so that you're not just nodding blindly and being like, yep, I trust you because that's not, that's great that I trust my husband, but that's not in my best interests. Like no. we should both know what's going on. Brian could disappear tomorrow. Like, I, I, I don't mean that in like, but, but, you know, and this happens to so- this happens to yes. so many women. They they lose yes. their husband either through divorce or through yeah. death. And all of a sudden they're like, I don't have a credit card. I don't have a credit rating. I don't have, I don't know where we keep everything. I don't, you know, like, and you, this is so important for us as women to be yes, financially informed where yes. it pertains to our well being. You don't want to be a 60 year old woman no. suddenly finding yourself with debt you didn't know existed or not being able to get credit for whatever reason, or being in a situation where you can't afford your home. Like nobody, that's, that's not the point in your life where you want those things to happen to you. So yes. It actually brings a lot of peace. Like you can actually, that's where you can dream bigger. That's where you can do the things because you can say yes. And with the confidence that the finances back you up, that you understand what you're walking into, you know, what you're signing, all of those things. I think definitely. I 100% agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really practical one. Um, I think for me, if I was to go back and tell myself, give myself um, a piece of business advice, and I actually think I learned this fairly quickly, and this may be my just because of my personality type, but it was it is one that I do wish I had known earlier, and that is that um, mistakes are good. It's good to make mistakes. <laughs> like, yeah. do not be afraid of making mistakes. It's how you learn. It's how you grow. It's how you get better at things. Yeah. And mistakes are just learning opportunities. And that was a huge one. My personality type tends to be just like, okay, that happened. It was crappy, um, which is funny given how much I worry. <laughs> right? But when the thing actually happens, it's like, okay, well, that happened. Okay, so we won't do that again. So now <laughs> we'll move on and we'll do something else yeah. or, okay, that was, I need to be more prepared next time, or I need to, yeah. 
research better next time, or I could have handled that differently. Now I know. Um, so I think, and I think that's one that a lot of people need to hear is that mistakes mm-hmm. are part of it. And I think you get yourself into more trouble by trying to avoid mistakes than by embracing them. Because when you try to avoid mistakes, you don't take any risks and you don't dream bigger. You get stuck in that one spot because you're just too paralyzed. And I see this all the time. I see it all the time in groups that I'm in with my clients where they just get mentally stuck because they're terrified of making the wrong decision. Yeah. Um, and really the decisions yeah. they're making, I know in their head, they seem huge, but in the grand scheme of thing, they're not, they're not huge. Like, yeah. you know what, if it doesn't work, just put it on well, ice and move on to the next yep. thing. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I mean, I, I've done that. I used to feel really badly when I would finish a canvas and I'd be like, well, I could have done better. Like I made a mistake here and it's not to say mistake, but artistically I'm put, put something here that I shouldn't have. I put mm-hmm. a swoosh there that you know, swoosh should have gone there. And I used to knock myself and be really, and I, this is partly money, but like, I was a waste of a canvas. You should have thought about that before you put the swoosh on there, but mistakes happen. And sometimes like I had a painting that came out of all accidental swooshes to do you know what I mean? So yeah. sometimes mistakes, like when you're not caring about whether a mistake happens and it's not to say you don't sort of plan, particularly on a financial, if you're taking a risk. Uh, but I would say artistically, even if you're taking a, a risk, mistakes can happen, but they can also yield some really amazing results. Right? Exactly. And if I think most of us, know that but we don't know it if that makes sense like when I'm starting a new design for a client and I open up Photoshop and I have a thing in my head and I start working on it and I'm looking at it and I'm like it's just it's not right you know like it's just not right but I can't put my finger on what's wrong and so you move something around and you're like what if I move this over here um and then the mouse slips and you wind up moving it to a spot you weren't planning on moving it to. And you're just like, Oh, Hey, well, that's interesting. (laughs) Right. Um, and it's because you made a mistake. So I think just being open to letting mistakes happen because so much good stuff can come out of mistakes and mistakes move you forward. And anytime you move forward, good things come out of that. So I think when you're not making mistakes, you don't grow, you don't move forward, nothing. You're just static and that becomes boring. And it just, it doesn't, nothing happens. You're stuck and nobody wants to be stuck. We don't, that's, that's not. um, And I would say, honestly, at at the worst, a mistake just offers a funny story for later. Yeah. (laughs) The the truth is most of us are not doing things where our mistakes are going to cause some kind of drastic, traumatic, life altering, um, consequences right we're not yes. brain surgeons we're not no. in charge of the nuclear plant <laughs> you know like we are yeah. we're artists and creatives and makers and yeah. um maybe you'll lose a client it happens to all of us at some point we're all going to lose a client or a customer um yeah so yeah so let's move into some of the responses we got from from yes. the audience because i think there's some um, I think we're going to, we'll have some good things to talk about this. So the, our first one is from Katrina and Lexi from Guyola. And so if you remember Katrina and Lexi, they were on episode 120. They're in the process of launching their own fashion brand based on their Latin American roots. And so the piece of advice they sent in is, be your own biggest advocate and cheerleader, because if not you, who will? And I think yeah. that is very, very true. I think we all tend to wait for and expect other people to say how wonderful we are to the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the truth is we have to get ourselves out there first. And I think there's a difference between being an advocate and a cheerleader. And I think you need to be 
both. Yeah. Um, like when you go to the bank and you're trying to get financing for whatever you want to do, you need to be your own biggest advocate you, because yeah. nobody else is going to tell the bank manager. Yeah. You know what, Heather, Heather deserves a loan. She's a nice yeah, person. Exactly. Right. Yep. Like bank yep. manager is going to be sitting there going, who cares? I don't care if she's a nice person. I want to know if she's going to pay the loan back in three years. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you have to be the one who stands up for yourself in all of those kinds of situations. And I think as women, we find ourselves in those situations frequently where we need to be more vocal about stand or we need to stand up for ourselves more, or we need to stand up and say, that's not right. What you're doing is not right. Or we need to stand up and say, you know, I deserve this. I've worked hard for this Um, because yeah, nobody else is going to do it for you. Nobody else. No. No. And even, even listing out the resume, even listing out your skills, why I deserve this loan, mm-hmm. why I should be featured in your magazine, why I, and those things I find, and this to, just to go back to why I would tell myself to dream bigger. I was always told I had a lot of confidence. I have had a lot of confidence my whole life. <laughs> and one of the things that I, I dreaming bigger would have required putting more confidence out there and I was already being told I was confident and so to the point that I I did not want to be that girl who was just too high on her high horse do you know what I mean yeah I feel people would see me that way but really I would have just been putting my best foot forward right yeah like and that, in terms of being your own advocate you have to have the confidence in the things that you have accomplished that got you where you are to say, I've done this and say it with such a plum that mm-hmm. you write like it's, and it's even tone of voice, it's attitude, like all of those things really own it, own your credentials. And I think yeah. that's a, that's a big one. And I think this is something that gets a little easier as you get older, because I think you can look back and see more of the things that you've done. And this is so interesting. So um, I didn't ask her if I could talk about this on the podcast, but uh, I was having a conversation on Instagram with a former guest and she was showing in her stories um, some work that she had done. And she was kind of, she had put it all together as a body of work Mm. in a physical form so that she could see it. And the reason she did it is because she was trying to decide how to lay it out in a way that she could present it in a physical form to potential customers. And I just sent her a message and said something like, isn't it cool to see all your work together like that? Like, don't you feel really satisfied by that? Because I think that is something we tend not to do. We tend to forget the things that we've done. Yes. You know? Yes. <laughs> and so yeah. when you actually put it together in in a physical space where you can see it, and and I, I feel like you'll get this same feeling when you have your gallery show, um, is to see it and be like, wow, like yeah. I did a lot. Like, yeah. yay me. I'm already, I'm already having that feeling because the stack of paintings that I've created, <laughs> like it's getting bigger and coming off the wall. And every time I walk past it, I'm like, whoa, that stack's getting big, Heather. And I pat myself on the back because, man, I'm proud of what I've done. And that, I think that unabashed confidence, I think that I wish I had had it earlier on yeah. in the, like you talked about in the, like, and my girlfriends and I, when we all turned 40, I felt like that was when we really embraced the, uh, hold on, let me get the acronym. I D G A F. I don't. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> right. That's when we really embrace that of, I don't give a flying fork what your opinion of me is. I know who I am. I know what I'm doing. I'm marching through the world. That's one and of the best parts of turning 40. Yeah. And I, 40, think, yeah. I think some of that would have facilitated the dreaming bigger in the youth if that if that, and I think that goes to what you said is that self-confidence and that uh, worrying about what other people think it's like all combined. Right. Yes. And on that note, I'm going to inter interrupt with another uh, point from a former guest. And this one is from Sharon Marie white. 
and she was on episode 90. So Sharon is a country music singer and songwriter. Yep. Um, and her episode was really interesting because we talked about ageism in the music industry and in the creative industry as well. So, um, and Sharon had a really interesting story. She's been singing and writing songs her entire life and performing, but she took a break when she had her kids and stopped performing. And now that they're flown the coop, she's gone back mm -hmm. to it. And, um, you know, the music industry, you don't see a lot of older women <clears throat> in the music industry, particularly. And, and yet she's out there doing it. And so her piece of advice plays right into what we were just talking about. And that is to be braver and not care what other people think. And this is again, easier said than done. Yeah. But I do think this is something that comes with age where you're just like, I think you just realize, like, you know, it is that sort of epiphany moment where you're like, I've got more time behind me than I have ahead of me. And I really want to get these things done. Like these are important to me. And I really, I want to do them. I want to get out there and see if I can be a successful touring musician, or I want to get out there and see if I can have a gallery show or, yeah. you know, I want to get out there. I want to see if I can paint. I want to see if I can do needlework. I want to try all these things because you're starting to realize like, you know, if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? And yeah. I think that starts to trump what other people think about you. Cause you just realize, yeah. I don't care. I don't care. I yeah. want to do this before time runs out. So I'm going to yeah. do it. Right. Um, so yeah, that was a great one. Thank you, Sharon. Another one that I want to bring up because I've got a few and then I'm, I know you've got a few, so I'll toss it over to you. Um, one that came from, this is actually a listener. She is a small business owner, but she's a scientist. And so she, um, she, she's somebody I would love to have on the show, but she's not in a creative field, but she has so much wealth of, um, knowledge, wealth of knowledge. Is that how you say it? wealth of knowledge. Yep. It just sounded really funny when I said it. Anyway, her name is Jennifer Andrews um, and she runs Fresh Leaf Marketing and uh, she helps life science brands grow. So basically oh, cool. more like medical and life science and things like that. She helps them with their branding, their marketing, all of that. And um, a lot of what she does I was going to say that sounds very over. creative. Yeah, it crosses yeah. over into what we do, um, but she just has a different target market than yeah. than we do and um yeah. she left some advice on linkedin and i think this is really a really solid piece of advice it's one that i actually need to be reminded of quite often and in her words it is basically that you don't need to do everything all at once you go through seasons and sometimes it's your time to rest sometimes to aim for the next big thing not all your biggest milestones or memorable experiences need to happen at the same time. It's okay for things to take time. And she mentioned that she is constantly working on that too. But I think, um, and it reminds me of a Tom Cochran song. And I, I love Tom Cochran. I love his lyrics. He just has these incredible lyrics that just sort of drill down into the heart of life. And mm -hmm. um, there's one lyric, and I'm trying to think which song it's from. I think it's victory day. It's one of his eighties songs where he says, life isn't big. It's kind of small, made of small moments, all strung together. And yes. that is one of my lines, music song lyrics that I try to live by is just to remind myself, like at the end of the day, it's all these small moments that come together to create your life and your business. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very much like getting up and putting one foot in front of the other. And it, it doesn't sound exciting or sexy or glamorous in the moment, but when you look back and you realize that all that putting one foot over in front of the other got you to a pretty incredible place. Um, and I think that's really important to kind of remember is that you don't want all those things to happen at one time. It's overwhelming. And it just, it's overwhelming. Yes. <laughs> you wind up freezing. Well, and I think, and I think too, that goes to the, like you got to do it all before you re retire or you've got to do it all before 40 or you've got to know like Julia Child didn't learn how to cook until she, she was 36. There's people who don't discover their, their, their thing until their forties, fifties, sixties. There's people who, who never picked up a paintbrush and started when they retired at 65. And, and so 
I think trying to have it all and do all the things on some sort of deadline, it like strips us of the possibilities of, of all the things that might just sort of encounter in life. And like, I feel like you're just limiting yourself by forcing it all, right? I think this is one for all the moms of younger children that listen yeah. to the show, because I hear this so often with my mom friends, not as much now because we're all getting to the point where the where the kids are old enough to be much more yeah. self-sufficient, right? But when your kids are in the stage where they need you all the time, um, I just have so many friends who just feel like they're losing themselves, right? Because yeah. it's all about the kids. And I think it's just important. Like this is, this is a season. They're not going to be young forever. And you need to just remind yourself, like, I'm not going to get this time with them back. Yeah. So it's okay to lose myself in this season yeah. because it will come to an end. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's the thing to be all in. Cause I think, and again, it goes back to that self-consciousness, like, Oh my, I don't see my friends enough. I don't do this enough. And it's all, but it's okay to be all. And honestly, I've been thinking about it in terms of my exhibit. Like I'm, I'm all in. And so I'm not going out as much. I'm not seeing as many people. I'm not freeing up as much of my time because I'm all in and I don't feel guilty about it. And the people who nobody feels shunted by it. I think because I think everybody understands that I'm all in. And I think it's like if you lost a friend to the parenting of toddlers, anybody who's pissy at you because you're all in parenting your toddlers is clearly not a very good friend to have. Like, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. you need, I think that's the thing too, is embracing when your friends and family are in the all in mode. Yeah. And, and they come out of it. You get them back. You, you yes, just, you get them back. And there's, but also, you know, we had a friend whose uh, parent recently passed and they didn't ask for help. They didn't need help. But I kept thinking to myself, if there's a way, like they're all in and dealing with that. If there's a way that I could just show up and be helpful, mm -hmm. shovel, drop off a meal. Yeah. In recognition in the fact that they're all in. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Whether it's all in in grief, all in in joy, all in creativity, all in in a career. I think that's our, our job as friends and people is to like support people better when they aren't asking for it, when they're pulling away because they're all into something good. That's, or that's a really important point to make because that's what happens when we're all in. We yeah. don't think to ask for help because we're all in, like it's all we can do to just tread water. Right. Um, and so that's why I think I remember telling a friend, like, if I'm bitching and moaning and groaning to you, I'm fine. It's when I go quiet that you need yes. to worry because that means like I'm, you know, overwhelmed, right? Yes. So, um, and I think that's really true. I think it's when your friends go quiet, that's when you need to pick up the phone or send them a text and just be like, hey, everything okay? Do you need anything? Like, you know, sometimes just hearing from you is all they need. So it's like, oh, I haven't oh, been sure. forgotten. You know? That's exactly it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. So I think you had, I have one more, but I'm saving it to the end because, um, but I think you have a few that you wanted to. I do. Yes. Let me pull them up. Hold on one second. Another word of wisdom that I'll pass on during this interlude is that technological challenges are always going to happen. <laughs> okay. It doesn't matter what okay, decade you're in. <laughs> so I got actually two and I think they actually play, I, I think they play off of each other. They're sort of. Okay to the same advice and it's from a, a girlfriend of mine named Sandy Knight she is actually uh I believe she's a dairy farmer in Manitoba um and so she says be true to who you are even if it feels like you don't fit in so I think that that's part of that self-confidence and, and authenticity is empowering and fulfilling and then her next one I think fits into that which is keep your circle strong surround yourself by those who inspire you encourage you support and celebrate you for who you are Yes. That was a big one. Yeah. I mean, you hear that. Uh, I don't know who originated it, but the whole thing, like you are the sum of the five people you spend the most amount of time with. Yeah. Um, I I think there's some truth to that. I, I don't think it's 100%, but, it, no. but it definitely is. Like when you surround yourself with people who encourage you and who spark your curiosity and who support you, um, that's that 
goes a long way into making you a better person. And, and, okay. and yeah. Another a friend of mine, Catherine McLeod, and she put in uh, your other people's opinions. Oh, so it starts here. Nobody cares what you're doing. They think you are worried about what you think of them, right? Other people's opinions don't matter and that your people will eventually find you. And it's rare. It happens in high school. And I, I found my people when I was six, I've had <laughs> girlfriends and we've been friends literally since we were six and we still, uh, we're a super tight knit group of girls. And we talk about how off, how rare it is that we found each other and how long it's been. But one of the things that I think is most enduring about our friendship is that because we met at a place that encouraged us to be our true selves, we met on a very authentic playing field. And so we have always known each other warts and all from the beginning. It's and so I think- funny. Yeah. That you say this because I'm doing Inco Rimo right now, which is yeah. <laughs> partly it's a marketing thing for my business, but it's also been really fun. It's um, yeah, inter- sure. international correspondence writing month. But the idea is that in the month of February, you send a handwritten piece of correspondence to somebody each day. And so I've been sending stuff to people who asked to get stuff from me. I I put it out on social media that I would send some goodies to people, but I'm also sending um, cards and letters and things to people that I'm close to, people to friends. And the first person I sent one to is my oldest friend. We've been friends since we were seven. And this is what exactly what I put to her in the note is that there is something like her and I are so different. We were best friends in elementary school. We drifted apart a bit in high school. We reconnected in university and we've stayed close ever since, but we're vastly different people now. And I honestly don't know if we met today, if we would be friends in the same way that we are. Um, But there is something about that shared connection from when you're that young you yeah. know, she knows, like she knows my parents. I know her parents. I know what it was like growing up in her house. She knows what it was like growing up in my house. And that is something that anybody who meets me now will never have. Yes. And so those people know you from, they they know everything. They know, they know yeah. where all the bodies are. <laughs> yes. I, honestly, I call, and it's so funny. I coined this term when I was working at a law firm because I was assigned to do a bunch of stuff in the IP department. And I was like, what's IP? I know what IT is. Anyway, it was intellectual property. And that I call these, those friendships, your intellectual property friendships. Those are the people (laughs) that have the intellectual property to know and be like, I call bullshit. I know Heather inside and out. But I also think, and this is to, to her, to Catherine's point, like, I do think too, though, that there's people who come to you later in life, like you and I met, 15 years ago and we, through work. And how often is it that when you encounter somebody through work that you remain friends and are friends with those people and you and I stuck and continue to stick. And mm-hmm. I think that's beautiful. And we don't have all that IP, right? But we have so much more. And I would say there's friends who you would know more of me than even people who might have learned, known me longer. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Same, right? same and, goes. And it, yeah. And I would say it's because we met on such a, uh, and we've, ex- we've had such interesting exchanges, this podcast, style, but like, I, yeah. So I think there's, and there's so, to me, it's like, there's value in the friends that you meet when you're six and there's value and, and there's, and all those friendships. I think that's one of the things friends come and go. And those are like seasons too. You can have seasons with friends. Yes. I was just going to say that it goes right back to Jennifer's point in that there, there are seasons with things and yeah. some people are not meant to be in your life the whole time. And some are, and yeah. there is a reason why people come into our lives and there's a reason why they leave and it happens when it's meant to happen. Right? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I think that's the big one is, is not fretting, like worrying if you, if, if friendships drift away yeah. about the like, if it really bothers you, pick up the phone and call the person. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And otherwise just rest in the confidence that 
if it's meant to drift back, it will drift back. Mm -hmm. You can always pick up the phone. Like the internet is there. You can find people very easily. Like it's not, you're not having to look, call up every Jane Smith in, in the phone book. And <laughs> right. Like you're not ripping pages out of the phone book and to find people. You can do it really easily. And I, and I've also, this maybe will circle back to the very beginning of our conversation in the women of a certain age, but I have been thinking, and this partly relates to my exhibition uh, and the theme around childlessness. And one of the things I've been reading a lot about is menopause and uh, perimenopause and the stages. And I, I've been thinking about it a lot in terms of because like one of the things that really bothered me is that when I got my period, I was told you're now a woman and this, because you have your period and because you're a woman, that's what makes you a woman is because you can have babies. And we know that that's, I would say, not an accurate description of what makes a woman a woman. There's lots of people who are not biologically capable of having babies and are women, right? Yes. So y'all can't see me. Heather can see me, but I'm rolling my eyes because I'm agreeing right? with her. <laughs> yes. And so I think, and I would love, and, and we have also been fed the, the menopause is like the end. Dum, dum, dum. This is it. You fade out, fade and, and scene, right? And this is where the invisibility comes in. I, I would like to challenge that. And I think that when a, a, a young woman gets her period that that's almost like a super Mario brothers game that it's like, doo -doo, next level activated and you move Power up. up yeah. too, right? <laughs> and so you go from childhood and then it's boop, next level activated and you're in this next level and you know, boop. And now in perimenopause to me, that's boop, boop, next level activated. And I've, I've leveled up. I'm here, like, this yeah. isn't the end. I'm not fading into black. I'm fucking leveling up. And then, <laughs> it's a good way to look yes, at it. Right? And then when menopause comes, that one day, that's all menopause is, is one day, right? It's the one day, boop, boop, next level activated. Mm -hmm. And to like, to me, that's the way I want to think about it because there's no ending. The ending is what we just decided is, right? And so it's leveling up. It has nothing to do with being a woman, not being a woman. It's just a phase of life. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's a season. It's a season. You yeah. have your period for a season and you don't have your period for a season. Uh, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And and we put so much more stock into it. This is when you become a woman. And then when you have menopause, you're dead. Nobody will see you. Just go into your little crone world with your gray hair and pet your cats. Like, <laughs> right? Whereas if we reframed it all from the very beginning, I feel like women would feel more empowered that this is like, I'm, I can, yeah, I'm doing aggressive well, hand you know, I'm doing aggressive hand <laughs> gestures, but like we're leveling up. <laughs> I think, you know, what was I going to say? Oh my God, my brain is just fried this week. Um, shoot. Leveling up. Oh, I know what I was going to say. There is freedom in invisibility. Yes. You know, like when you feel like you're invisible to the world, you can do whatever the hell you want because nobody's paying attention to you. Like, so, you know what you want to wear? This is why old women wear purple hats, right? Nobody yes. cares. Nobody, yes. <laughs> right? They're doing it. It's it's them sticking their finger, their middle finger yeah. up at y'all and saying, we're wearing purple hats because you guys don't even pay attention to us. So who cares? Yeah. Right? So I think, you know, there is a, there's, there is freedom in invisibility. I think that's, level, I think that's leveling up the like I your invisibility cloak, right? Of your four, it is. It's your invisibility cloak, and like, where can you go, and what can you do? What kind and of? Taking, and to me, it's like taking advantage of the fact that people are so stupid that they render if if their stupidity renders you invisible, that's their problem. That your invisibility cloak led you. To, to do all right. the things. Wanted. Use that cloak to wreak havoc. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, we have one more, and I saved this one for last because I really liked it. Um, I liked all of them. Like that's not to say that the others aren't great, but this one really struck a chord with me. And this one was from Kristen Rainey, um, and Kristen Rainey has been on the show on two episodes, eighty six and ninety nine. She is an urban gardener and floral designer based out of Saskatoon, and um, she does some really incredible work. She just had her fourth baby and uh is prepping for garden season already for her business so um her piece of advice is that no one cares as much as you do so stop stressing about everything being perfect good plus good equals excellent especially if multiplied with consistency i love that last line good plus good equals excellent multiply it with consistency and you have something pretty damn special. And I think this is such a big lesson and it goes back to us saying, you know, get up every morning, put one foot in front of the other and things will happen. And this is essentially what Kristen's saying is like, it doesn't have to be perfect. Stop getting so caught up in perfection. And I say this as somebody who has always struggled with this. Um, But if you're just doing good work, good solid work every day, and you keep doing good, solid work every day, good yeah. things will happen. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and those ha- healthy habits, there's a thing we listen to, uh, healthy habits are the building blocks of your life. Mm-hmm. And all of those things. And I have been thinking about that. I fell off the workout train. I'm trying to get back on. Mm-hmm. And literally my metric is, did I do it? Yes mm-hmm. or no. Whether it was half an hour or two hours, whether I sweat or not, did I do it? Yes. Perfect. It's the consistency yeah. and doing, and to me, good enough is good enough. And that, which is hard to let go of, I think sometimes. It's very hard to let go of, um, particularly if you're struggling. I, I think where a lot of us struggle is like bringing help into our businesses yeah. because nobody will do it as good as we can. Um, it does. They don't have to do it as good as you can. They just have to do it good enough so that you can keep doing it every day and you can do other things that you're good at. And weirdly, quite often when you hire people to do these things that you're tired of doing or that you don't want to do or that you don't like doing, they're better than you at it. Yes. (laughs) So so that just compounds your progress towards excellence, right? And and even if they are, this is such a random connection, but a girlfriend of mine just got a cleaning lady And she was trying to figure out ways that she could just afford her life more time. And she realized that that was one of the things that she could hire out and would give her life more value Mm -hmm. and financially she could afford it. So she decided to do it. And I said, how's it working out? She said, well, she doesn't clean the bathroom as well as I would like. And I said, yeah, but do you still have that time? Like what in terms of the value? So is good enough in that checkbox still worth the value that you're getting out of the found time that you're Mm -hmm. And she said, yes. And I said, so then it's a win. Like, good Check enough. the win column. Good enough. Good enough. <laughs> Check right? the win column. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same with like over the years, I've done several hundred day projects and I've done a couple 365 projects and I'm doing a 365 project this year where I'm doing um, a doodle a day for the whole year. And I'm post. if you want to see them, I'm posting them on Instagram every day. You can go check it out. That's so cute. And, um, and, and I'm trying to keep it in, I realized halfway through January that 365 days is a lot of days Yeah. <laughs> when I'm only on day 20. It's like, I've done a lot of drawings and it's like, yeah, I got 345 more to go. You're going to have such a body of work when you're done. Yeah. Well, this is what's been really interesting is that Miss Doodle, who is this little cartoon character, essentially that I draw, I was looking at her the last few that I've done. February is Miss Doodle month. That's what I'm focusing on for Feb. I'm trying to give myself themes each month to keep it interesting for myself. So I was looking at her the other night and the ones that I've done so far for February. And I was also pulling out some cards for an order that I was filling, which were Miss Doodle on the cards. And I was like, wow, she's changed a lot. Like, and then I was thinking, you know, the Miss Doodle on the cards and looking back to where she's like the very first incident of Miss Doodle. And I'm actually thinking of posting this on uh, Instagram at the end of, at the end of February is like, here's where she started. Here's where she is today. And I mean, 
if you've seen her, Heather's seen her. She's yeah, that's why I'm like, I'm so fascinated to see how she's, she's evolved. She's a stick figure. So you would sit there and think, how much can a stick figure but evolve? But it's crazy. <laughs> and because I'm I'm also following the Opus um Opus Art Supplies here in BC, they run an Opus Daily Practice challenge every February where they give you prompts. And I'm using their prompts with Miss Doodle to kind of give myself something to chew on, like give myself an idea because coming up with a different idea for 365 days is a lot. lot. (laughs) So the prompts (laughs) help. I'm not usually a prompt person, but this is helping. Um, And a couple of them have been kind of esoteric type prompts where I've been like, I don't know what to draw. And so I've been doing like studies of her. So I did a study of like one prompt was contrast. And so I did this study of Miss Doodle and like, she's basically round circles and wavy lines with straight edged shapes and straight lines. Like that's what she is. It's not that complicated. Um, And then yesterday I did the prompt was emotion. And I was just showing, this is all the ways you can draw emotion with a stick figure. Um, And I get a lot of that inspiration from Charles Schultz, who who drew the Peanuts characters. You look at the Peanuts characters, they are very similar to Miss Doodle, round heads. They're not stick figures, but, you know, and the amount of motion that he was able to convey in those kids, it's wild. Yes. (laughs) So, you know, that's what I was, I drew like this study of like all the different emotions that this little redheaded girl can feel. And I was just kind of like, wow, this is so interesting how how much she's changed over the years. And one of the things I realized is that she's so simple. Like when you break it down, she's a circle on a triangle with straight lines sticking out and wavy lines on her hair. Anybody could draw her, but she is actually harder to draw than- I was going to say, I don't think anybody, because I bet you if I tried to draw, draw Miss Doodle, it would look like Heather's stick figure. But there was no <laughs> it would. Miss Doodle. And she's harder to draw than like, I also do little tiny houses like that are quite detailed, um, which, which when you look at them, you'd be like, oh, that, that looks like it would be hard to do. But they're, to me, they're actually easier. They take longer, but they're easier than drawing this little stick figure character. And, but, but the point is it is taken, I, I don't know, I think it's been six or seven years since she first appeared. I think it was. 2015 maybe 2014 so actually more more like eight or nine years yeah so it's quite a while I, I have a miss doodle in my, my studio that you sent yes. me that was and that was a while ago because I was still Melissa I think that's probably like seven or eight years old yeah because she was established when I sent that to you she wasn't yeah. brand new but no. she first appeared on a trip I took to Montreal and Toronto when I was prepping for a conference that happened in 2015. So that, that trip may have happened in 2014. So, so she's been around, she's been around for a while, Um, but just seeing the progression and that's what comes from getting up and doing the thing every day, doing the consistency. Um, And that's why I love hundred day projects because they're, you can see improvement. You can see what happens when you show up every day. Yes. And when you're consistent. And that's why I loved what Kristen had to say. When you multiply it by consistency, something really special happens. Yes. Yeah. So I love that. Yeah. I think that's a great way to end mm-hmm. um, on a great note to end on. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I think that's it for this week. Um, do you have anything else? No, that was a lot. I feel like I, I need to actually. I do. And I don't know when we started recording. A little bit we more. Had- we had some technical challenges this morning, so I don't know how long we've actually been recording. <laughs> a four-hour episode with Melissa. And it has not been four hours. I know that much. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, Heather, it's been a, a little while since you've been on the show. It was back in November, I think, was your last visit. So maybe let everybody know where they can find you. Yes, you can find me on Instagram. I'm at Heather Travis. And you can find me on my website, which is Heather Lynn Travis. And my middle name is Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E. Yes, so you can just Google me and you'll find all my happy art online. I have a variety of awesome prints available for sale right now. She does. Yeah, she does. And she is working on her first solo exhibit to happen this fall. So that's exciting. And if you follow her on Instagram, you can see um, all the 
work that she has been doing to prep for that show. Um, it's going to be quite impressive when you're done. You have quite a body of work. Yes, so. I won't be able to get into my studio to get to it because I'm painting. <laughs> All right, everyone, that's it for this week. We will be back soon with another brand new episode. Until then, a thank you for listening, and we will talk to you all later. Later. Thank you so much for joining us for the And She Looked Up Creative Hour. If you're looking for links or resources mentioned in this episode, you can find detailed show notes on our website at andshelookedup.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter for more business tips, profiles of inspiring Canadian creative women, and so much more. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show via your podcast app of choice so you never miss an episode. We always love to hear from you, so we'd love it if you'd leave us a review through iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Drop us a note via our website at anshelookedup.com or come say hi on Instagram at anshelookedup. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.